Hey guys, in a previous video in the series, I went over the principles behind each covenant that Latter-day Saints make in the temple endowment ceremony. In this video, I'm going to be going over the relationships between all the covenants we make, how they build upon each other, and how they all fit into the new and everlasting covenant. In addition to these principles, I'm going to be going over the ancient roots of our temple covenants. Uh, because the covenants that we make in the temple today have strong connections to how covenant making was done in the ancient world. These archetypal patterns of covenant making can help us better understand our new relationship with God when we covenant with Him. The covenants we make in the temple endowment ceremony build upon each other progressively, but they also iterate over each other. As I've mentioned in a previous video, it's really not a bad thing that there's overlap between our temple covenants. After all, these same but true gospel principles are the surest way to happiness in this life and the next. I personally believe that the covenants progress from a state of introspection to extrospection. They help us progress from thinking about ourselves and our own spiritual welfare towards thinking more selflessly about others and bringing the entire covenant community to become more like Jesus Christ. As I've alluded to in other videos, we progress from focusing on the first great commitment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength to focusing on the second great commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. The law of obedience helps us strip ourselves of pride by submitting our will to the will of the Father. We show God that we love him by obeying his commandments. And the law of sacrifice similarly shows our willingness to serve and love God by offering a broken heart and a contrite spirit to him. We again learn to submit our will to the Father and sacrifice other distractions. The law of the gospel encourages us to enter into a higher and holier way to show our love and devotion to God. We are to abandon impure and unholy practices that would detract from our efforts to becoming true disciples. The law of the gospel has an aspect that does start to look more outward in its exhortation to support the Lord's anointed. While we ultimately swear loyalty to God, he works through the church, which is run by imperfect mortals. God has appointed certain leaders to run his church, and so in order for the work to go forward, it's imperative for us to sustain and support God's chosen leaders. Now, the law of chastity focuses a little bit more on loving others as thyself. It focuses on your behavior, but it also focuses on the effect your behavior has on others, namely your spouse. It prohibits you from hurting people outside of that marriage relationship, and it also encourages you to build the marriage relationship through the means of sexual relations. The law of consecration really focuses a lot on that second commandment to love the neighbor as thyself, because it's focused on building a covenant community by giving your time, talents, and everything to building the kingdom of God. The law of chastity centers on the relationship between you and one other person, your spouse, and the law of consecration focuses on the relationship between you and the rest of the covenant community. In the temple endowment, there are five distinct covenants that we make, that of obedience, sacrifice, gospel, chastity, and consecration. But all of these covenants fall under the umbrella of a macro covenant that God made anciently with Israel and continues with his covenant people today, the new and everlasting covenant. Through entering into this covenant, one promises to love and serve God and love and serve others, and in return, God grants eternal life. This covenant began all the way back with Adam and Eve. It was continued through Noah, renewed with Abraham, with David, Solomon. When Jesus Christ came in the New Testament, he established a new covenant. And then in the latter days, he established the new and everlasting covenant, as it talks about in the Doctrine and Covenants. The Lord declared that all old covenants have I caused to be done away in this thing. And this is a new and an everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. This covenant has assumed different names over time, but it's really all an implementation of the same covenant promise that God makes with his children. Love and serve God, love and serve others, and be granted eternal life. While today covenants are mostly used in religious contexts, they were a lot more common in antiquity. Covenants were just a, a really easy way to make agreements with each other, and they followed a very predictable pattern. If you remember in a previous covenant video I did, I said that a covenant is a ceremony which outlines certain obligations which results in a new relationship. In other words, a covenant equals a ceremony plus obligations plus a new relationship. And that's a religious covenant stripped down to its barest bones. And it's true of ancient covenants and temple covenants as well. Uh, but in the ancient world, they did have a few more steps in their predictable pattern. Covenants in the ancient world frequently included the following elements, a preamble, a historical prologue, stipulations, a formal witness, blessings and cursings, and a deposition. And that's a mouthful, so I'm going to go over what each of these are. But these elements can be traced throughout scripture and in our temple covenants. Identifying this pattern can help us understand why we make covenants so ritually and formally in the temple, 
And it can also help us build confidence that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God who was restoring ancient ritual. But now let's go over what each of these elements are. A preamble is just an introduction, much like the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. It'll often name the parties in the covenant, much like we include the names of parties in a legal contract. The historical prologue, as its name sounds, kind of provides some background for the covenant itself. In a vassal treaty, it might include all the things that the king has done for his subjects in the past. The stipulations are the meat of the covenant. These are the terms and conditions. It's everything required for the covenant to be valid. The witness might be the formal oath-taking part of this process. It's when the parties would formalize their relationship by agreeing to the terms. The witness might also include a list of other parties present to witness the event, such as heaven and earth, God, angels, and other people present at the time. Covenants also included blessings and cursings. This is a declaration of the fortune for obedience or the consequences for disobedience to the terms of this covenant. While the concept of cursings does sound a little harsh, you're probably familiar with this concept. If you've ever made a pinky promise with a friend on a playground when you were a kid, you might have said something like, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. And as a kid, you weren't literally serious about doing those things, but you did want to impress the seriousness of this promise you were making with your best friend. The deposition is a statement detailing the writing down and preservation of the text of the covenant or treaty. It's documenting how the content of the covenant would be deposited, hence deposition. If there's not a physical writing down of the covenant, such as on a scroll or a monument, there may be a clause to memorialize and remember the covenant through an oral recitation or through a festival celebration. To give an example of how this pattern plays out in real life, we can trace this pattern throughout scripture. We've got examples in Genesis 12 through 17, Exodus 20 to 24, and like the whole book of Deuteronomy. And it even shows up in the Book of Mormon in Mosiah chapters 1 through 6 when King Benjamin is making a new covenant with the Nephites. But all of those examples are really long. A really nice short example are the first few verses of Exodus chapter 19. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So in verse 3 you've got the preamble. The Lord identified the parties of the covenant, the children of Israel, and the Lord. In verse 4, you've got the historical prologue. The Lord mentioned what he had previously done for Israel by delivering them from Egypt. In verse 5, you've got the stipulations. The Lord says that the Israelites need to obey his voice and keep his commandments in order for them to become a peculiar treasure unto the Lord. And there is some overlap between the stipulations and the blessings and cursings, which in this case include the Israelites becoming a kingdom of priests. In verse 8, you've got the formal witness. The Israelites formally swear to abide by this covenant when they respond to Moses that they are going to do everything the Lord said. And then finally, the deposition is alluded to in verse 7 when Moses recites this covenant to the elders for them to keep. And we see this pattern pop up in covenant ceremonies even in the modern secular world, such as presidential inaugurations, wedding ceremonies, royal coronations, and uh, swearing in of Supreme Court justices. In the case of a presidential inauguration, you've got a preamble, which takes the form of like an invocation. The national anthem, which tells the story of America, can be that historical prologue. You've got the terms of the covenant, when the president says, I'll solemnly swear to fulfill the office of the presidential office of the United States, da, 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 da. You have a formal witness, while they're swearing this oath, they'll raise their right arm to the square and they'll place the other hand on the Bible. And there's even a deposition because at, after the inauguration ceremony, they'll go and have a signing ceremony to formalize this new covenant. In the temple, unsurprisingly, we also utilize this ancient covenant making pattern in each of the covenants we make in the temple. All the patrons are reminded that they are to view themselves as Adam and Eve, respectively. This declaration forms the preamble because it identifies the parties of the covenant, you and the Lord and Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve symbolize each person that enters into the new and everlasting covenant that started with the fall and continues today. 
As we've talked about in previous videos, the Temple Endowment Ceremony includes a presentation of the Plan of Salvation, including a discussion of creation, fall, and atonement. This serves as the historical prologue since it introduces everyone to the previous history of what God's done for us entering into this covenant. The stipulations or terms of each covenant we make in the endowment ceremony is outlined in the ceremony. And if you want to learn more about the stipulations of each of these covenants, you can check out my previous videos. The formal witness occurs when each participant verbally and ritually agrees to the terms of the covenant. The officiator will also remind everyone present of the heavenly witnesses that attend to the covenant. The series of blessings and cursings is more lightly alluded to in the Temple Endowment today, but at the beginning of the Temple Endowment ceremony, the script does talk about how those who fulfill their covenants will have blessings. God's made it very clear that the whole purpose of this endeavor is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In an earlier version of the endowment ceremony, each covenant was accompanied by a declaration of theoretical consequences for disobeying the covenant. These were eventually removed from the endowment ceremony, but everyone who enters into these covenants should understand the seriousness of the covenants they're making and that there are consequences for disobedience. Alma talks about how wickedness never was happiness. As for the deposition, in the temple endowment ceremony, we also receive ways to memorialize the covenants we make. In the temple, we are taught certain symbols to help us remember and honor the covenants that we make with God. And I'm going to be covering these covenant symbols in a future video. Knowing the technicalities of ancient covenant structures may sound tedious and unnecessary, but I do think they can help us understand the context of the endowment a little bit better. The way we do things in the temple is highly ritual and very symbolic, and it's different from everything we do in the mundane world. But it's important to know that these patterns of covenant making are ancient and sacred. God covenanted with Abraham in the same pattern that he covenants with you today. By covenanting with God in the temple, we enter into a new relationship with him as his sons and daughters. Using this covenant format can help us acknowledge the antiquity of these promises and help us formalize and focus our worship. So to summarize, each covenant we make in the temple helps us progress from being sincere disciples to members of a larger covenant community. Each covenant we make in the temple inducts us into the larger new and everlasting covenant, which describes the relationship that God forged with mankind throughout different periods of history. Each individual temple covenant that we make follows an ancient pattern that connects us with the whole company of saints that came before us, back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the way back to Adam. Adam.